Who are the Holy Angels? Excerpts from The Holy Angels by Father R. O. Kennedy, Neil Upstadt, Timotheus O'Keefe, Imprimatur Henricus Edradus, Archbishop of Westminster, October 21, 1887. The Angels The meaning of the word angel is messenger. That name is given to those pure spirits because such is the relation they bear to God and us. Their principal duty, however, is the same as the office of the blessed in heaven, to see, love, bless, and enjoy God forever and ever. Among the ancients there were many who believed there was nothing in the world but what could be seen or perceived by the senses. The Sadducees, for instance, did not believe in the existence of spirits. It is the boast of modern atheists and rationalists that there is nothing but nature and the forces of nature. With some of them there are no angels. Some of the Greek philosophers held that there was angels, but that these angels had bodies, not indeed corporal, dense bodies like ours, but bodies suitable to their nature, thin, airy, star-like bodies, some even of the fathers, on account of the angels being represented as having the appearance of men, seem to favor the theory of their having bodies. Patavius says that Uranus, Tertullian, Origen, and others held this doctrine. Now Catholics say that the angels are pure spirits, because wherever in Scripture they are introduced, they are simply called by the name of spirit. Quote, are they not all ministering spirits? End quote. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Who makest thy angels spirits? Psalm 53. The fourth council of Latrian has defined that, quote, God created together out of the beginning of time, out of nothing, both classes of creatures, spiritual and corporal, the angelic to wit and the material, and then the human, as a composite of both spirit and body. End quote. Even Aristotle says, quote, All nations believe that there are individual intelligences beyond the sky, that these are subject to no change and to no passion that they are in enjoyment of the fullest and most perfect life, which consists not so much in action as in contemplation, that they have a king, that they differ from men, and are inconceivably more excellent. End quote. Question. How did these men conceive the idea of an angel? Answer. We can only answer by conjecture. Perhaps from the responses of idols or their prophecies, perhaps from the motions of the heavenly bodies, or from some extraordinary facts which we were not to be explained by any knowledge they had of nature, or better and more likely, from the ancient tradition of the patriarchs. Cardinal Newman's notion of the angels before he became a Catholic will prove interesting. Quote, it was, I suppose, to the Alexandrian school and to the early church that I owe in particular what I definitely held about the angels. I viewed them not only as the ministers employed by the Creator in the Jewish and Christian dispensations, as we find on the face of the Scripture, but as carrying on, as the Scripture also implies, the economy of the visible world. I considered them as the real causes of motion, life, and light, and of those elementary principles of the physical universe, which, when offered in their developments to our senses, suggest to us the notion of cause and effect and of what are called the laws of nature. This doctrine I have drawn out in the sermon of Michael Maste, written in 1831. I say of the angels, Every breath of air, and ray of light and heat, every beautiful prospect is, as it were, the skirts of their garments, the waving of the robes of those whose faces see God. End quote. Now, what would our reason tell us? This. We are persuaded of the innate nobility of spirit, but as it exists in us, it is united with a strange and, to it, repugnant nature, hampering, fettering, clouding, perplexing it. Then we say, if there be a just God, putting everything into order, order being heaven's first law, there ought to be a world of spirit alone. Again, we look at ourselves and find that we are a compound of material and immaterial, the material we find existing outside us, by itself alone. We look, therefore, for the immaterial existing by itself alone, in this order, 
One, material. Two, material and immaterial united. Three, immaterial. If we look to the visible world, we find this gradation. Mineral world in the lowest grade. Vegetable world, nobler. Animal world, noblest. God, who is a pure spirit, says the great Bousset, wished to create spirits like himself, pure and immaterial like him, living by intelligence and love, spirits that would know him and love him, as he knows himself and loves himself, and who, like him, would be happy in simply knowing and loving the first great being, and he is himself happy in knowing himself and loving himself, and for that very reason they bear on their nature a divine character which makes them after his image and likeness. Question. By whom were immaterial substances created, or is it possible to create them? Answer. It was God who made the angels, says Bousset. Quote, o God, who can doubt that you could create spirits without a body? Or is there need of a body that one might understand, love and be happy? You, who are yourself so pure a spirit, are you not incorporeal and immaterial? Are not intelligence and love spiritual and immaterial operations which can be exercised without the need of a body? Who doubts, then, that you could create intelligences of this kind, and you yourself have not left us in doubt, but have revealed it to us? End quote. Question. But at what point of time were the angels created? Answer. It is a matter on which all theologians are agreed that the nine choirs of angels were created at one and the same time, that they were not created after the creation of earthly bodies. Some of the ancient fathers, following the opinion of the great and learned Origen, have held that the angels existed for a long space of time, or at least for some time, prior to the point of time indicated by the book of Genesis, where, in its opening verse, it says, quote, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. End quote. Among the Eastern Fathers holding this opinion were such holy and venerable names as St. Basil, St. Gregory Nanzianzen, St. Chrysostom, St. Damascene, and among the Latin Fathers, St. Hilary, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome. That is no longer held. On the contrary, the common opinion, which it would be rash to deny, teaches that the angels were created at the same time with the corporal world. The scriptures, Ecclesiasticus chapter 18 says, quote, He who liveth forever made all things together. St. Augustine infers from this that God created all the things of the world in one moment. Nevertheless, it seems the more acceptable opinion that the word together means about the same period, without any notable interval of time elapsing, and is perhaps to be understood of collection or community rather than of time. The phrase, in the beginning, seems to be taken here, as also in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel, as meaning, quote, in the commencement when created things began to be, end quote. Now, since angels are created things, they seem to be included in this description of the inspired writer. It is thus that Epiphanius, Theodoratus, Venerable Bede, St. Thomas, Sorez, and almost all modern writers write and teach. The definition of the fourth council Latrian has been already given. It says, quote, God created together at the beginning of time, out of nothing, both classes of creatures, spiritual and corporal, the angelic to wit and the worldly, and then the human as a composite of both spirit and body. End quote. The Vatican Council has repeated these same words and embodied them anew in a definition. Now, the juxtaposition of the words together and then seem to point out that the angelic and the corporal worlds are created at one and the same time, but that it was some time afterwards when the humans came into existence. St. Thomas argues, the angels are a part of the universal creation and form a regular grade in that creation. Now, no part can be perfect separated from its belongings, and God's works are said to be all perfect. But the angelic world would have stood by itself, separated from the rest of creation, if it had been created before the sensible world, and therefore, to the eye of the metaphysician, would have been much less perfect than it formed conjointly and simultaneously with the corporal world. 
It is therefore all but a matter of faith that angels were created at the same time, i.e. simultaneously with the pre-Adamite world, out of whose chaos and void God drew the beauty and order of ours. But why did not Moses mention the angels in Genesis when he was relating the works of the creation? Why did he not give them first place, as they were the most excellent of God's works? St. Jerome says Moses omitted them because he was treating of the visible world only. St. Cyril says because all he proposed to write about was what had reference to man. St. Augustine says that the angels are meant in the word heaven and even in the word light. If this were not well understood among the Hebrews, that people would come to believe that the angels were never created, and therefore eternal. St. Thomas thus explains the secrecy of the great lawgiver on the matter, quote, that if it were openly told to a rude and uncultured people, as the Hebrews were, and so especially prone to idolatry, that beings of such an exalted and beautiful nature existed, possessing such an influence in the world's providence and economy, they would, without doubt, have raised altars and sacrificed to them. End quote. Even Moses' own dead body had by God's providence to be kept secret from them. It is true that in many places Moses speaks of angels, but in such a manner as above all to declare that there is but one God, and to testify that these are no more than his ministers, servants, messengers, and with such care that nowhere do we find it related that the Jews raised idols to them. God created the angels and the stars, how ancient the angels are we do not know, though we know that spiritual and material natures were created at the same moment. Quote, God created the angels and the stars. How ancient the angels are we do not know, though we know that the spiritual and material natures are created at the same moment. In all ways the angels are wonderful to think of, because they are so strong, so wise, so various, so beautiful, so innumerable. End quote. Father Faber, Precious Blood, page 9. Question. What is the number of the angels? Answer. It cannot be given. Nothing is known exactly of their number. It is beyond human calculation, like the stars at night. The number is indefinitely great and all but infinite. The Holy Scriptures pretend but to give a vague idea of the immensity of their numbers. Daniel chapter 12 verse 10 says, quote, Thousands on thousands ministered to him, and ten hundred times a hundred thousand assisted before his throne. End quote. The Apocalypse, chapter 5, verse 2 says, quote, And their numbers were thousands on thousands. End quote. Job, chapter 25, verse 3 says, quote, Whether is there a limit to the number of his soldiers? End quote. There is a fitness in the multitudes of the heavenly hosts. God created beings to be happy around him. His omnipotence and his beneficence would not be expressed by a scanty number. The vaster and the more incalculable their numbers, the greater the manifestation of his power and his blessedness. It is written in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 28, quote, In the multitudes of his people lieth the glory of the king. The ignominy of the prince is the scantiness of his nation. End quote. If we make a computation of all the members of the human race from Adam to the last man, the numbers will all but pass beyond the reckoning of human figures. What reason is there that the angels should be less in numbers? Bousset says, quote, Count, if you can, the sands of the seashore. Count, if you can, the stars in the firmament. Those that you can see as well as those that you cannot. And when you have done so, be firmly convinced that you have not yet reached the number of the angels. For, point out to me what is most perfect in heaven or on earth, and on that I say, does God most lavishly outpour the abundance of his omnipotence and his love? End quote. Quote, Prodigality is a characteristic of all the divine works. We cannot meditate on the countless multitudes of the angels without astonishment. So vast a populace, of such surpassing beauty, of such gigantic intelligence, of such diversified nature, is simply overwhelming to our most ambitious thoughts. 
a locust swarm, and each locust an archangel, the myriads a point of life disclosed to us by the microscope, and each point a grand spirit, the sands of the seas and the waters of the ocean, and each grain and each drop a beautiful being, the brightness of whose substance we could not see and live. This is but an approximation to the reality, so the theologians teach us. End quote, Father Faber. Question. Are the angels all of one species? Answer. The angels are not all of one species. Scripture frequently speaks of distinction and differences. Some angels, some archangels. Theologians generally teach that different gifts of grace have been bestowed on the angels, marking out, therefore, different capacities, i.e., different species. St. Dionysius, writing on the heavenly hierarchy, says, quote, The sacred volumes declare that these holy superior beings differ from one another by different grades. St. Jerome, writing against Jovinian, quote, Among the invisible creatures there is a manifold and an indefinite diversity. St. Augustine and St. Anselm teach the same. Reason would tell us if we look at bird differing from bird, beast from beast, flower from flower, tree from tree, that the variety of the species enhances the beauty and harmony of the creation. The same way is it with the beautiful angels in heaven. Question. Are there many individuals in each species? Answer. The great St. Thomas would have it that there is only one angels of every species, thus showing forth the magnificence of the designs and the perfection of this wonderful work of God. This is not the opinion commonly held, however. Nearly all the rest of the schoolmen hold the opposite opinion. St. Augustine finds an unanswerable argument in the fact of the condemnation of the angels, for he says, quote, If each angel constituted a separate and distinct species, then numerous separate and distinct species were condemned to hell, and lost absolutely and forever to heaven, which can hardly be thought of, whereas, if there were several individuals of each species, there would still be representatives of each species in heaven. End quote. With our notions of things earthly, it appears rather to harmonize that there should be many members of each species than that each angel should constitute a distinct species. Cardinal Newman, in his Grammar of Ascent, without, however, giving any adhesion to the doctrine, says, quote, The angels have been considered by the divines to have each of them a species to himself, and we may fancy each of them so absolutely sui similis as to be like nothing else. End quote. Father Faber, in his work All for Jesus, says very beautifully, quote, Scripture teaches us a great deal about the angels, their worship of God, their ministries towards other creatures, their individual characters, as in the case of Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, their multitude, and their nine choirs by names. Some theologians have thought that each angel is a species of himself which would, indeed, open out quite an overwhelming view of the magnificence of God. Others, with more show of reason, make twenty-seven species, three in each choir, as there are three choirs in each hierarchy, and even this gives us amazing ideas of the court of heaven, when we remember how hard it is for us to conceive of any further specific division of reasonable creatures than into those with bodies and those purely spiritual. End quote. The Natural Life of the Angels We know what the natural life of man consists in. He breathes, his heart beats, his blood circulates, he eats and he drinks, he sleeps and he walks about, he thinks, reasons, acts. Now, in what does the life, the natural life of the angels consist? In four things. In the exercise of the intellect, the exercise of the will, the interchange of thought, and the power of acting. This is the teaching of the divines. The angels, by the natural power belonging to them as angels, can know God, can know themselves, one another, and finally the soul of man. They know God. God was their first beginning, their last end, and his knowledge was the primary and chief object to which the powers of their intellect were to be turned. They know themselves, 
That is simply what we understand by being alive. They know the other angels, as being fellow citizens of the heavenly city. They know the human soul, as forming a portion, like themselves, of God's vast creation. Question. Can the angels know, and do they know, all the material things of this world? Answer. Yes. They know all the material world. They know the mineral world and all its properties, such as geology, for example, teaches, but in an indefinitely higher degree than geologists know it. They know the vegetable world and all its varied and different properties also, flowers and shrubs and trees and vegetables and mosses. They know the firmament world. All the astronomy teaches about the suns and the stars, their motions, their orbits, their substances. They know all about the animal world and its equally diversified creatures, their formation, their habits, modes of life, from the microscopic animal, Kula, to the lord of the creation, man. God gave them this knowledge, and it may be said of them that if they did not know these things at one glance, they would have a curiosity as being members of creation, to know these things were which formed other parts of the same creation as they were. Question. Do the angels know future things? Answer. The angels know some, not all, future things. They know those things which necessarily follow from natural causes, but the things which are merely accidental in the future are those necessary consequences of natural causes which by God's providence or otherwise may be changed, they do not know. Let us take example of the foretelling of a storm which an American paper appears to the unlearned to supernaturally predict. Now, an angel knows that a current of air is passing in the western regions, and knows all the laws whereby the atmosphere is guided, it knows at what speed it is traveling, it knows at what time, with a certain rate of motion, it would reach a given place. As a rule, it could predict of it that it would do so by a certain period. Men can do that much. Thus, to an extent, it can tell future things. But unforeseen causes may arise and interfere, and then it would not be infallible in its judgment. Suppose a person was sick, one of those mentioned in the Bible, and sick unto death. An angel, from its superior human medical skill, would predict its death. But in the meantime, our blessed Lord is entreated. He enters, and the disease flies at his approach. Then the angel would be mistaken in his calculation. So speaks St. Thomas. But Soares and others hold that the angels know what will eventually happen, provided these things depend upon necessary causes. This will be better understood by the following. Question. Can they know future things not arising from necessary causes? Answer. No. For the knowledge of future things that depend on free will for their coming into being is ever set down at the special mark of the divinity. Quote. Tell what shall happen in the future, and we will know that ye are gods. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 23. I am God. And there is no one like me, telling from the beginning the latest thing to happen, and from the commencement the things that have not yet begun to be. End quote. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 9. St. Hilary says, What is so peculiar to God as the knowledge of the future? St. Hilary, To no one else but to one, and that one God, does it belong to know the future. Tertullian, the truth of the divination I hold to be the distinct testimony of the divinity. This is important as it leads us to understand what is the knowledge of the demons and whether they can foretell future things which did not happen by fixed laws, as, for instance, when the oracle was asked, quote, Shall Pyrrhus conquer the Romans? End quote. The oracle did not know. The answer it gave was ambiguous. It made reply, quote, the Romans, Pyrrhus, shall conquer, end quote, which might mean that Pyrrhus would conquer the Romans, or the Romans would conquer Pyrrhus. Hence Cicero says, quote, their divinations were partly false, partly true, end quote, as may happen to anyone, often are still ambiguous so as to square with any event, and therefore their responses were generally despised by the more learned and keener-minded of the heathens, as Origen and Eusebius testify. 
the Roman general had little confidence in the sacred chickens. On one occasion, when before a battle they refused to take their food, he flung them into the sea, without the exclamation, quote, If they do not eat, let them drink. End quote. This, however, lost him the battle, for the soldiers, thinking it a bad omen, got so disheartened that they easily yielded to the enemy. Question. Can the angels know for a certainty free acts of the intellect and the will either in other angels or in man? Answer. No. Not without the consent of the others. God alone can do so. Scripture says, quote, God searches all hearts and understands all the thoughts of the mind. Thou alone, O Lord, knowest the heart of man. End quote. Quote, Wicked and inscrutable is the heart of all. Who shall understand it? I, the Lord, searching the hearts and reins. End quote. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 17. St. Hilary, quote, The thoughts of the heart, it is not ours to know, but his, of whom it is written, God searching the reins and heart. St. Ambrose, when the Lord wishes to save men, he showed him that he was God by his knowledge of hidden things. St. Chrysostom, but that you may know it belongs to God alone to know the secrets of hearts. Hear what the prophet says, thou alone knowest hearts. End quote. This is the feeling that God's own hand has implanted in our minds, namely, that our thoughts should not be read by every passer-by, but only by those we wish, and according as we ourselves would reveal them. We would even conceal them, if possible, from God. From this it follows that the devil, when he tempts us, can only guess at what is going on in our minds. He cannot know for certain, except from our own outward manifestations, how we receive his suggestions, and whether we yield to them or not. Question. Are the mysteries of faith, as, for instance, the dogma of the Holy Trinity, as much beyond the natural power of the angels to understand as beyond ours? Answer. Just the same. They can no more of their own powers understand the great mysteries of faith as they really are, no more than we can. They must bow their heads as we do when reflecting on the Incarnation, the Blessed Eucharist, etc. Question. But in natural things that they can understand, is there a knowledge from inference in the angels, i.e., knowing one thing, do they conclude another? Answer. No. They see all natural things at one and the same most luminous glance. For instance, they know at one glance the essence of man's nature all its properties, individual conditions, and so on, the same way with all the material world. And from this, we are also to conclude that there is no such thing as being deceived with the angels in those things which come within their knowledge. Question. What is meant by the morning and evening knowledge of the angels? Answer. Divines distinguish two sources of knowledge in the angels— 1. By the beatific vision, the angels see all things, present, past, future, and most perfectly in God. This is called the morning knowledge, because both of it, its priority and its clearness. 2. The angels afterwards see things as they really take place. This knowledge is not so noble, nor so perfect as the morning, and therefore, because of its lateness and its dimness, is called the evening knowledge. St. Augustine, in his City of God, says, quote, The knowledge of a creature is, if I might use the expression, more discolored than the knowledge of it as seen in God, just as art is less than the first principle, nature, and therefore, very fittingly, is that knowledge called evening knowledge. St. Thomas says, quote, As of forenoon and the afternoon a day is customarily made up, so of morning and evening science the days and knowledge of an angel. End quote. It is well to remember these two terms. Question. Can the angels desire and love and hate or rejoice in sorrow? Answer. These things are attributed to them in the scriptures, but none of these external things affect their substantial bliss and glory and happiness in the beatific vision. Question. Are the angels endowed naturally with free will like man? Answer. Yes. The scriptures everywhere speak of them as obeying the commands of God, as worthy of reward or punishment, 
and this could not be unless they had free will. The Holy Fathers, St. Damascene says, quote, An angel is a being endowed with free will, for everything that makes use of reason is also endowed with free will. St. Gregory, quote, God ordained that whatsoever is honored with reason and intelligence is ruled by free will. St. Fulgent, quote, God gave liberty to the angels that their loyalty may have the approval of their will. End quote. Question, are the angels of their own nature exposed to sin? Answer, yes, the angels, not alone in their nature, but even raised to a supernatural order and strengthened, therefore, by God's grace, did actually sin. St. Jerome says, quote, It is God alone to whom sin cannot be imputed. All others, since they enjoy free will, may turn that will to either side. St. Ambrose, quote, Every creature, according to the capacity of his nature, receives the accidents of good and evil, and feels the same yielding to evil. St. Augustine, It is manifest that sin is destruction, annihilation, and that men, when they sin, become nothing. End quote. Now, according to St. Thomas, quote, every creature has this of its nature to tend namely to nothing, since out of nothing it was made. End quote. Therefore, to make use of the words of St. Augustine in his City of God, quote, every intellectual creature is mutable, i.e., prone to sin, since out of nothing it was made. End quote. Bousset says, some creature, and they most perfect, are drawn out of nothing, just as others, and those, all perfect though they may be, are exposed to sin. One being alone is, by his own nature, impeccable, he who is of himself, and who by his essence is perfect. But since he alone is perfect, it follows that everything besides is defective, according to holy Job. Quote, and he hath found deprivation even in his angels. End quote. Again, the rule directing angelic intelligence is by nature either intrinsic or extrinsic. If the former, the rule would be identified with the very nature of the actor, and could not, therefore, be deviated from. But if the latter, then it can. Now the rule in the case of the angels, as well as, as in that of man, is the sovereign will of God, which is extrinsic, and which may consequently may be deviated from, and hence angels may sin. To quote the words which the great bishop of Muo addressed to a fallen angel, quote, Truly, everything drawn out of nothing has still some of its belongings. You were sanctified, but not essentially holy as God. You were ruled at first, before you fell not as God, whose own will is his rule, but you were ruled by an indefectible sovereign will, the will of God. End quote. To be naturally peccable, it is sufficient that one can be drawn aside by any passion, as pride, envy, hatred, and also that one be free to follow or resist that passion. Now, that is what happened in the case of the angels. Question. Does not sin presuppose in the intellect a defect either of truth or of attention to that truth, and that surely such could not be in the case of the angels? Answer. Generally, indeed, there is some defect, for it is hard to believe that an intellect such as the angels, strongly and intently gazing on truth, could, without that defect, give way to sin. Yet that is not absolutely impossible. But an angel, speaking now only in the natural order, does not at every moment consider all the things it might consider, nor again does it consider all with equal attention, for this is the necessary consequence of the possession of free will. Therefore it can fail in attention, and in will too. At any rate, it is certain that they, like us, possess, happily in one sense, unhappily in another, the great gift of free will, whereby they might obey or disobey, love or hate, the great creator of all. Question. Can the angels converse with one another, and how? Answer. The angels speak one to another. The scripture uses the same word of their conversation that it does to designate human speech. Quote, the seraphim cried out one to another and said, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3. Quote, 
if I should speak with the tongues of men and of angels. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Quote, when Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil, he said, The Lord command thee. End quote. The Epistle of Jude, chapter 1, verse 9. And so all the fathers. The angels, therefore, can speak to God. They praise his power. They extol his majesty. They beseech his clemency. They consult his wisdom. Thus it is related in Zachary, the angel replied to God and said, quote, Lord of armies, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? Zachary chapter 1 verse 12. In the book of Job, Satan is introduced many times as speaking to God. In like manner, the angels can speak to men, as the archangel Gabriel to the Blessed Virgin. St. Thomas, and with him the generality of theologians, are of opinion that, though angels can speak of their own natural powers, yet in communication with themselves, there is no need to make use of words, but that God has so made them that the mind speaks to mind. This, too, seems more noble and more in accordance with our notions of angels. Quote, Cast your eye over the outspread ocean, whose shores lie so faintly and far off in the almost infinite distance. It gleams like restless silver, quivering with one life, and yet such multitudinous life. It flashes in the light with intolerable magnificence. Its unity is numberless. Its life is purest light. Into the bosom of its vastness the glory of God shines down, and the universe is illuminated with its refulgence. It is an ocean of life. Who can count the sum of being that is there? Who but God can fathom its unsearchable caverns? What created I but, but it dazzled with the blazing splendor of its capacious surface? It breaks upon its shores in mighty waves, and yet there is no sound. Grand storms of voiceless praise hang over it forever, storms of ecstatic lightning without any roll of thunder, whose very silence thrills the soul of those human saints and is one of their celestial joys, that deep stillness of unsounding worship. This is the word of the angels. In quote, Father Favor, Precious Blood, page 140. Question. What is the power of the angels with regard to this visible creation? Answer. The power of the angels is immense. The scriptures ascribe to them the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sennacherib's army, and of the firstborn of the Egyptians, and to the bad angels, Job's afflictions, the destruction of his goods, and the death of his children, the possession of men, as in the New Testament, the rushing of the herd of swine into the sea, etc. Thus also of the Antichrist, the principal minister of Satan, miraculous things are foretold in the Apocalypse. We cannot exactly define how great is their power. This, however, we know, that they cannot contravene any of the divine or natural laws, or even the physical laws of the globe, that their power is entirely subject to the wish and permission of Almighty God. Quote, Otherwise, the evil spirits could any day overturn the entire world. End quote. Banal Treaty de Angelis. Later, on this matter, will be treated more fully. Here it is sufficient to say that they can produce most wonderful effects as exciting storms and tempests, striking the earth with interior motions, causing foul dreams and diseases, or sometimes curing sickness and wounds, and bringing about health in man or beast when it pleases God to allow them to do so. Question. Are angels superior to man? Answer. The natural excellence of the angels far surpasses that of man. The scriptures say, Thou hast found him a little less than the angels. Psalm 8, verse 6. This text, in its mystical sense, is used of Christ, but in its literal historic sense is made use of with regard to man. Of the demon it is said, there is not a power on earth that could compare with him. Job chapter 41 verse 24. St. Augustine in his City of God says, quote, The angelic world in its natural dignity surpasses all other things that the Lord has made, and from its very excellence, he argues, 
by so much was their transgressions the more culpable by as much as their dignity was the more sublime. End quote. Even the very Gentile races believed in their superiority and also in their power to injure or serve, and hence they paid to them an inferior worship as beings to be propitiated. Question whether, during their time of trial, did the angels receive supernatural grace? Answer, yes, all the angels received grace from God during their time of trial. The good angels received it, they were created for eternal blessedness just as man, and grace is as necessary for them in order to obtain supernatural merit as for man. Therefore, they received supernatural grace. St. Basil says, quote, There is no sanctification without the Spirit, for not even the virtues of heaven were of their own nature sanctified. If that were the case, there would then, indeed, be no difference between them and the Holy Ghost. End quote. Didymus, in his first book on the Holy Spirit, says, quote, The Holy Ghost not alone accompanies, as an indweller, men who are far away from heaven, but even does so with each and every one of the angels. End quote. St. Damascene, quote, By a word the angels were created, and by the sanctification of the Holy Ghost they have received all manner of perfection. End quote. The bad angels received grace, for the same asserted of them as of the good angels, and the scriptures and the fathers strongly emphasize the fact. Isaiah, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, who didst arise as the morning? End quote. These words mean a fall from a place of eminent dignity and excellence, such as the wonderful brightness and splendor of the grace of God. No natural brightness of the angels, great though it be, is like Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 12, quote, That was the seal of remembrance, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That was in the pleasures of the paradise of God, every precious stone thy covering, the serratus, the topaz, and the jasper, the chrysolite, and the onyx, and the beryl, and the sapphire, and the carbuncle, and the emerald, gold the work of thy beauty, and thy pipes were prepared in the day thou was created. Thou a cherubim, stretched out and protecting, and I set thee in the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day of thy creation, until iniquity was found in thee. End quote. The Holy Fathers, in commenting on these words of Ezekiel, apply them to Lucifer, although in the sacred text the words are historically addressed to the king of Tyre. Writing on, quote, that was the seal of remembrance, end quote, they understand the phrase to signify that Lucifer was created with a very great excellence to an exceeding close image of God. And the other words, quote, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, end quote, are always used in scripture as the perfection of supernatural grace. Our blessed Lord himself says of the demon, quote, he was a murderer and stood not in the truth, end quote. John chapter 8 verse 44. Now, by the word truth in this text, St. Thomas and the fathers, especially the Greek fathers, understand grace. The same is said, in other words, in the epistle of St. Jude in the sixth verse, Quote, and the angels who kept not their principality, but forsook their own habitation, he hath reserved under darkness in everlasting chains. End quote. Man, as is commonly held, was created in the state of grace. Now, it was fitting that angels, too, should be created in a state of grace, since the end for which man and angels were created was the same. Since, moreover, the angel's nature was more perfect, and therefore ought not to be longer deprived of the grace of sanctification, and since especially all of God's works are perfect, and ought not, therefore, to be less so in the case of angels than of men. Question. But did they receive sanctifying grace at the instant of their creation? Answer. Most probably, and all but certainly, yes. St. Augustine says, Quote, God created the angels, building up in them their nature, and at the same time bestowing on them his grace. End quote. Saint Basil, quote, the angels were not created in a weakling state, by degrees increasing and growing perfect, and thus became worthy of the reception of the Spirit, but in their very formation, 
and as if mixed with their substance, they received at the instant of creation the infusion of grace. St. Bonaventure, discussing the matter, thus writes, quote, It is to be answered that this is a question of fact, and since there is nothing else to guide us than the congruity of God's doing so, we may regard both opinions as probable, like others before us. Some say that the angels were created in grace, and they argue from God's liberality and the angels' fitness that it must be so, God being willing to give where no obstacle is placed, and the angels being pure and clear vessels offering no obstacles to the infusion of his grace, so that God did not leave them empty, as it were, even for a moment, but the instant he created them, that instant he enriched them. They find an analogy in his creation of the inanimate world, The trees he brought forth clothed with verdure and laden with fruit, equally so all other things in their highest and noblest state, and hence they infer the angels in the enjoyment of grace. Others, however, there are who hold that the angels did not receive grace at the first instant, but afterwards. They argue that, though God could do as the supporters of the other opinions say, yet his liberality is regulated according to wisdom and justice. For instance, God could have redeemed man immediately after his fall. It would appear to have been more liberal than what he did, yet he did not. Then it were more fitting, they say, that the angels, seeing how good the grace of God was, should covet it and thus receive it. According to this view, Lucifer never had grace, and if he, who was the highest among them, had it not, a fortori the others had it not, This opinion, the master of sentences, Scotus, seems to accept, and indeed it may be looked upon as the more generally accepted of the two. It is further argued by them that the angels' conversion must take place from some different standpoint. From this the good angels were converted to good, and therefore deserved merit, the wicked to evil, and were therefore condemned. This is no longer the common opinion. Modern theologians find it under every sense more convenient to hold that God created the angels from the very first in a state of grace, and that he placed the labor of trial before them. What that trial was will be discussed later on, that the wicked angels failed in their endurance of that trial, and their sin was therefore doubly malicious, that the good angels were faithful and stepped from grace to greater grace and to the enjoyment of the beatific vision. Quote, each angel perhaps had thousands of beautiful graces. To many of these, we on earth could give no name, if we beheld them. But they were all wonderful, all instinct, with supernatural holiness and spiritual magnificence. End quote, Father Faber, Precious Blood, page 15. And again, quote, God became a king by becoming a creator. It was thus that he gained an empire over which his insatiable love might rule. Nature is very beautiful, whether we think of angelic or human nature. Created nature is a shadow of the uncreated nature, so real and so bright that we cannot think of it without exceeding reverence. Yet God created neither angels nor man in a state of nature. This is, to my mind, the most wonderful and the most suggestive thing which we know about God. He would have no reasonable nature, even from the very first, which should not be partaker of his divine nature. This is the very meaning of a state of grace. He, as it were, clung to his creation while he let it go. He would not leave to it breath for one instant in a merely natural state. The very act of creation was full of the fondness of maternal jealousy. It was to speak in a human way, as if he feared that it would wander from him, and that his attractions would be too mighty for the littleness of finite beings. Oh, that majesty of God, which seems clothed with such worshipful tranquility and the eternity before creation! How passionate, how yearning, how motherlike, how full of inventions and excesses it appears in the act of creation! Question What mysteries of fate did the angels know explicitly during their probation? Answer. The unity of God, and all those attributes which belong to the unity of God, as, for instance, that he is the sanctifier, and that he is the great rewarder, according to St. Paul, 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder to those that seek him. Quote. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 6. In order to love God above all things, it is necessary that we must have supernatural faith. For how else could we have hope in him? Or how else could we look to him as the object of eternal blessedness? Therefore, the angels had such supernatural faith. Also, during their time of trial, the angels understood all those truths which natural reason teaches regarding God as the Creator, the Supreme Lord, the First Truth, etc. The angels knew by divine revelation the mystery of the sacred trinity and believed in it, such is the common opinion held by theologians, and that the angels understood it much more distinctly than we do. Even the prophets of the old law, it is believed, knew of the trinity. Quote, in the Old Testament, there is not, indeed, that express mention of the Holy Trinity which is to be found in the New, either because there was a danger of the Jews being led to believe there was more gods than one, or because God wished by little and little to lead the weakness of man's intellect to the knowledge of the highest and the most inconceivable mysteries. Yet are there many passages where vestiges of the sacred trinity are to be found, nor are there wanting testimonies from which it may be gathered there are several persons in God. End quote. Delhalog. He quotes in proof the following quote, Let us make man to our own image. End quote. Genesis chapter 1. Quote, Behold, Adam is become as one of ourselves. Genesis chapter 3. At the Tower of Babel, quote, Come, let us descend. Confound their tongues, end quote, on which St. Chrysostom says, quote, Behold, I beseech you how the voice of the Father calls on the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is the voice of one addressing two equals. St. Thomas says that the essential beatitude of the angels, i.e., after their term of probation, consists in the intuitive vision of the divine essence. Now the divine essence, as it is in itself, cannot be seen without the three divine persons also. Therefore, Soares argues, an explicit faith in that mystery during the term of probation ought to be required as a necessary means to salvation. End quote. Arguing from what is required in man vis-a-vis -vis, an explicit faith in the sacred trinity, both in man's fallen state and in the Christian dispensation, we conclude that it was required also in the angels. It was not required under the old dispensation, but that was because of the imperfection of the old dispensation, an imperfection which is not to be attributed to the state of the angels. It is most probable the angels knew of the mystery of the incarnation by divine revelation and believed in it. St. Thomas among the elder schoolmen and the great Suarez among the modern are the leaders in the opinion which hold that the bad angels fell because of this wonderful act of divine condensation. They desired the hypostatic union for themselves and envied it to man. Quote, the mystery of the kingdom of God, which is fulfilled in Christ our Lord, all the angels indeed knew of from the beginning in some qualified way, but chiefly those who were made blessed, confirmed by the vision of the word, a vision which the demons never had. End quote, St. Thomas. St. Paul says, quote, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God adore him. End quote. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6. It was therefore fitting for the glory and honor of the Son of God, who was to come in human flesh, that the angels should know this mystery. Moreover, Christ is the head of the angels, and the angels his ministers, and therefore it was proper that from the commencement they should acknowledge him as their Lord and Master. Question. Did the angels know this mystery fully with all its circumstances and details? Answer. It is believed they did not. Most likely the angels during probation knew it only in an obscure way, just as it was one of the first things told by God to Adam, and he then had an undefined knowledge of it as a future event which God would bring about in his own way. Adam, however, knew that the Redeemer was to be born of woman. So, too, the angels. 
St. Thomas says they did not know all the circumstances relating to the redemption, but after probation it is believed the angels knew this sacred mystery, and not to mention their knowledge by reason of the beatific vision. They knew it partly before Christ, partly after, either by the will and revelation of God, or by the prophecies, or finally, by seeing the acts of Christ himself, and by the teaching of the apostles, according to the saying of St. Paul, quote, To me, the least of all the saints, is given the grace to preach, in order that the manifold wisdom of God may be known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places through the church, according to the eternal purpose which he made in Christ Jesus our Lord. End quote. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Father Faber thus speaks of their knowledge of the precious blood during their terms of probation. Quote, the angels wonder more than men, because they better understand it. Their superior intelligence ministers more abundant matter to their love. From the very first he invited the angels to adore it. He made their adoration a double exercise of humility, a humility towards himself and of the humility towards us, their fellow creatures. And it was a test to which he put their loyalty. He showed them his beloved Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, in his sacred humanity, united to a lower nature than their own, and in that lower nature crowned their king and had to be worshipped by them with absolute and unconditional adoration. The son of a human mother was to be their head, and that daughter of Eve to be herself their queen. He showed them, in that blood, the source of all their graces. Each angel, perhaps, had thousands of beautiful graces, Yet there was not a single grace in any angel which was not merited for him by the blood of Jesus, and which had not also its type and counterpart in that precious blood. The precious blood, man's blood, was as the dew of the whole kingdom of the angels. It would have redeemed them had they needed to be redeemed, or were they allowed to be redeemed. But as it was not, so it merited for them, and was the source of all their graces." Well then, may the angels claim to sing the song of the Lamb, to whose outpoured human life they also owed so much, though not because it was outpoured. End quote. Father Favor, Precious Blood, page 15. It is to be understood that the angels did not clearly know or see God during their time of trial, and the reason is, quote, because this knowledge is the primum premium, which being attained, the soul rests blessed and happy, end quote, St. Bonaventure. Not even in heaven will the angels know God as he really is, the most blessed soul of our Lord Jesus Christ, great and wonderful as it is, will not know the divine essence fully and entirely. To do so, an intelligence should be as infinite as God himself. No created intelligence is infinite, and therefore the human soul of our blessed Lord, insomuch as it is a created thing, cannot know God fully and entirely as he is. St. Bonaventure says, quote, The good angels had no foreknowledge during their time of trial that they would remain faithful, nor had the wicked any of their fall. If such were not the case, a twofold inconvenience would arise. First, if God gave to the good angels a foreknowledge of their remaining faithful, then the devil might excuse himself that he did not get a foreknowledge that was vouchsafed to others. And secondly, if a foreknowledge of their fall was disclosed to the wicked, then they were left without hope and tempted to their ruin. And furthermore, the pain begotten of such knowledge would be unjustly inflicted by God, inasmuch as it was inflicted before they had committed any evil. To none, therefore, of the angels, he concludes, was their future lot revealed. End quote. Question. Did the angels, while in a state of probation, elicit acts meriting future glory? Answer. Yes. Just as men on earth elicit meritorious acts, so did they. The scripture says, quote, No one is crowned except he who has legitimately striven. End quote. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 and in Proverbs 12:14 to each one there shall be given according to the work of his hands End quote. this is the law of god not alone for men but for angels also the holy fathers 
Pope Gelasius says, quote, that the angels were so constituted as to merit an increase of eternal glory is sufficiently indicated by the fact that, had they stood in need of nothing more, then none of them could have committed evil. St. Prosper, writing on the contemplative life, says, quote, It was the action of the will of the holy angels that while their companions with their own free will fell, they themselves remained in the dignity wherein God had placed them. And hence it came to pass, by a divine and a most just judgment, that what was only up to that a holy desire of remaining with their God became thereafter a voluntary and most blessed necessity of remaining with him forevermore. End quote. The argument from reason, the angels good and bad, were placed in an equal condition with regard to merit and demerit. Now, the wicked angels had the power of demeriting and did demerit. Therefore, the good angels had the power of meriting and did merit. Again, it is more perfect to have a thing from one's own act than to owe it absolutely to another. Therefore, since all God's works are perfect, namely, of meriting by their own acts, the angels had that perfection. How long that state of probation lasted, we do not know. But this seems to be the order of the angel's act. First, by a free act, as in the case, for instance, of adults being baptized, they receive with all their reason and will sanctifying grace. Secondly, placed in that state of sanctifying grace, they were then in a position to earn supernatural merit. And while in that position, as all the Holy Fathers and the theologians teach, they were still viators, travelers, i.e. not as yet confirmed, and as such, that they elicited acts deserving of supernatural reward. Quote, Consequently, according to almost all, that subsequent act by which an increase of grace and glory was merited was, in a way, a distinct act from the first act, and corresponding to several instants of our time, and coexisting with several acts which have been ordered them by God, and which were successive in the angels themselves. End quote. Question. Did the angels, who were most excellent by nature, receive more grace, merit, and glory than the others who were not so excellent? Answer. Yes, that is the common opinion of the fathers and the theologians. St. Basil says, quote, The angels received their measure of sanctification according to the proportion by which they exceeded one another. End quote. St. Damascene, quote, the angels, each according to his dignity and class, were made sharers of light and glory, end quote. And the fathers take this doctrine from St. Dionysius, who says he learned it from St. Paul, quote, De cello hir, end quote. Argument from reason. The angelic nature had been created by God for the purpose of receiving grace and enjoying blessedness. And as there were different choirs and different orders of spirits, and as variety adds to the beauty of a work, so was it fitting that there should be among the angels different degrees of grace and merit and glory, just as there is amongst men, or just as a builder in raising a house will dress some portions of it more elaborately than others. Care must be taken, however, not to confound efficacious grace with the graces of which we have been speaking. God made no position or class of angels which should necessarily demand from his bounteous hand efficacious grace, or be necessarily denied it because of its individual position or class. Question. What was the degree of grace and merit, and therefore of glory in the angels? Answer. Nothing more definite can be said than, as St. Thomas puts it, that it was, quote, intensely great, both by reason of the supremely excellent nature of the angels, and because God always increases and multiplies whatever is good. End quote. In comparing their grace with that of man, and accepting our blessed Lady alone, it may be said that it is immensely greater than among the saints. The Blessed Virgin is placed beyond all, as the Church on the day of her Assumption proclaims, quote, She is exalted above the choirs of angels in the heavenly kingdom. End quote. And hence, Suarez is of opinion that perhaps there is no other except the Blessed Virgin, or at least very few among the children of men, that can be compared with, at any rate, the supreme angels in their perfection of grace and glory. 
Here we have to adore the liberality of Almighty God and the mysterious and adorable way in which he distributes his gifts. First, he fashions the angels in a natural order, and in that natural order he endows some with greater natural perfection than others, according to the ideal in the divine mind from eternity. Next, he raises these angels in the first instant of creation to a supernatural order by the gift of sanctifying grace. Then comes the time of probation, and after that term he confirms the good angels forever in glory and bestows on them the beatific vision and happiness and enlightenment and splendor, according to their own acts truly, but still more in proportion to the natural powers and dignity and excellence his own divine hand have bountifully bestowed on them from the beginning. Here indeed was the potter and the potter's clay spoken of by St. Paul. To man he acts differently, not in proportion to his natural excellence, to the powers of his mind, or to the outward gifts of his body does he reward him, but, quote, The foolish things of this earth have God selected, that he might confound the wise, and the weak things to confound the strong, that no flesh may glory to itself in his sight, End quote. And yet some of those weak things, and those foolish things, God has placed in an equality with nay, even beyond the brilliant angels who never knew the weakness and the foolishness of our earthly nature. End quote. Question. When did the angels come into the possession of the beatific vision? Answer. Before the resurrection of our Lord? Yes. For our blessed Lord says in St. Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, quote, Their angels always see the Father's face. End quote. All the fathers understand this of the beatific vision. Now, Christ says this of the angel guardians, who have but the last place in the heavenly hierarchy. And therefore, by much more reason is it to be understood of the higher angels. Before Christ's coming, yes, for Daniel says, Thousands on thousands minister to him and stand before him. And in Tobias we read, I am the angel Raphael, one of the seven who stand before the throne of God, end quote. Before the fall of man? Yes, for Satan was then a fallen angel and condemned when he tempted our first parents, and from that we construe that the unfallen angels were then confirmed in glory, for according to St. Thomas, quote, God is quicker to reward than to punish, end quote. All theologians are agreed that, quote, after the shortest delay, taking into account their opportunity for meriting and God's decrees in their regard, the angels were confirmed in eternal glory, End quote. Quote, the beautiful life of the angels in heaven, God's eldest born, may also furnish us with ample materials for intercession, and our Lord seems to call our attention to it when he bids us pray that we may do his holy will on earth as the angels in heaven. Sister Minima of Jesu Nazarino, a Carmelite nun who lived at the time of the French invasion of Italy and spent a life of incessant and wonderful intercession, used continually to offer to the Divine Majesty the love of the first choir of Seraphim and reparation for all the outrages then going on in the world. It was remarkable, when we come to think of it, that neither angels nor men were created in a state of nature, but in a state of grace and were thus able at once to love God and to merit eternal life, which is nothing else than to eternal society with him. Grace was a better position than nature for loving God. By grace, he could communicate himself to us supernaturally. By it, he at once got more love from us and made us more able to love him. Oh, that we had the hearts to take this in and all that it involves. If we are come to weights and measures with infinite goodness, surely his love of us should be our measure of love of him, a measure to which we must never cease to aspire, though we shall never attain it. Well might St. Francis run about the woods in the valley of Spoleto. O God not known, God not loved! Well might St. Bruno cause the mountain solitudes to echo his one life-long cry. O goodness! Goodness, goodness, well might our dearest Lord appear to St. Gertrude, pale, weary, bleeding, and dust-stained, and say, Open your heart, my daughter, for I want to go in and lie down. I am weary 
of these days of sin. But at last, as we grow in the knowledge of God, we grow in his love also. Father Faber, all for Jesus. This has been a production of Alleluia Audiobooks. For more free audiobooks, please visit us at alleluiaaudiobooks.com. You are free to make copies of this CD to give to your friends and family, but we do ask that you do not alter the original audio. Thank you, and God bless. All you holy angels, pray for us.